Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, greetings from wherever you may be on this planet, and welcome to another edition of SETI Live. And today we have a very special edition, a little bit longer than some of our other uh, SETI Live talks, but we hope you'll stay and join us. Uh, very important and, uh, and I think central to who and what the SETI Institute is all about uh, topic today. And uh, my name is Bill Diamond. I'm the CEO of the SETI Institute. And you'll see in my, my background image here, uh, a set of dishes, which is known as the Allen Telescope Array. It is our own radio telescope interferometer based up at the Hat Creek Radio Observatory in Northern California, about five hours or so from San Francisco. Um, and we're gonna be talking about the Allen Telescope Array. We're going to be talking about the technology behind it. We're going to be talking about the SETI research that is conducted on the Allen Telescope Array. But most importantly, we're here to talk about and acknowledge someone uh, who's been a key member of our team, a key benefactor of the research at the Institute, a family member, a dear friend, and uh, an, an individual without whom um, we could not have really achieved the status we currently have uh, in SETI programs at the Allen Telescope Array. And I'm speaking of Franklin Antonio, who uh, is, was a co-founder of Qualcomm, the uh, chip company down in San Diego, quite world famous and quite important in communications technology. And Franklin um, suddenly and, uh, and, and tragically left us uh, just a couple of weeks ago at the too young age of 69 years. Uh, but Franklin was a brilliant uh, uh, mind, uh, an incredible inspiration to all of us at the SETI Institute. And as I said before, um, he was not only someone who, whose philanthropy enabled SETI research at the Institute, but he was a member of the team. He came to the meetings at least twice a week and met with everybody and coached us and taught us and cajoled us and pushed us and inspired us and prompted us. And, uh, and, and it was so wonderful and engaging and inspiring to have him um, with us as a member of the team. So today we want to honor his legacy. And we're going to talk, of course, a bit more about Franklin and his own interest in, in space and space science and exploration. We're also going to celebrate his legacy by sharing with you um, images and videos and stories about the research that he has enabled, the technology hardware development, software development, the, the feeds, um, all the hardware and um, uh, infrastructure behind SETI research that we undertake at the Institute at the Allen Telescope Array. So we wanna share with you what Franklin made possible and this is in his honor. Um, so what I'd like to do is start today by just having um, my colleagues here on this call introduce themselves. Um, and then I'm going to turn things over to um, our colleague, Andrew Simeon, who's the uh, head of SETI programs at the Institute and elsewhere, uh, to talk a little bit more about um, the uh, Allen Telescope Array and Hat Creek Observatory and, and Franklin's impact. Um, we're gonna hear from Roy Davis with a bit more uh, context and information about Franklin himself and, and his interests and passion beyond his work at Qualcomm. Um, and then we're gonna go into uh, some storytelling and image sharing about what Franklin made possible for us. So with that, I'm gonna call people by name and ask you just to say hello and introduce yourselves and maybe where you are because some of you are sitting in interesting places. So start with you, Sarah. Hello, um, my name is Sarah Schultz. I'm a, I'm a research assistant at the Hat Creek Radio Observatory. Um, I'm in the feed lab on site um, and you can see one of our newly built feeds that we are working on um, should be going on here once we get a new period pyramid in the next few weeks. So, great, and we'll be talking more about those feeds and showing you more more detailed imagery of them in a moment. Um, over to you, Alex. Yeah, um, I'm Alexander Pollack. I'm the director for the Head Creek Radio Observatory, and I joined the project about three years ago. Um, working on the refurbishment of the feeds and the hardware and then took over the um, management of the site and getting basically all of the keeping everything alive so Wael can run observations. Excellent. And speaking of Wael, over to you, Wael. 
Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wael. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the SETI Institute. Uh, my, my background is radio astronomy. Um, I'm interested and, and, and intrigued um, by radio astronomy. Um, and I'm currently situated on, on site, um, literally right behind where Alex is. So I can look into two cameras at the same time and you can see me in 3D. Maybe that's, um, <laughs> that's, the, um, that's the advantage here. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm um, glad to be here on, on this call to talk about um, Franklin and Franklin's legacy and what, what, we, what we have achieved with, with Franklin's um, help in terms of um, observations on sky and, and radio astronomy in general that happens on site. Wonderful. Thanks, Wael. Andrew. Um, thanks, Bill. My name is Andrew Simi, and I'm the Bernard M. Oliver Chair for SETI at the SETI Institute. I'm uh, located in, uh, in in California, working from home, as I'm sure um, many of you watching this are are probably doing uh, as well these days. Um, and uh, it's um, uh, uh, sort of a, a bittersweet, I think, um, opportunity for for all of us. I think to um, you know certainly to to celebrate. Um, what Franklin has has enabled, um, but not just what what he has enabled, but what he will enable in the future. What what his legacy will will enable. Um, the fact that all of these these people are gathered on this call that we have, you know, Alex and Sarah and YL and, and Jack and um, and even myself is really a, um, a a testament to Franklin's support um, and the the energy and the rigor that he uh, infused into our our, our project. And it's. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of fun to remember that uh, today as we as we go along. Absolutely, thanks, Andrew. Jack, thanks, Bill. Um, my name is Jack Hickish. I have a, a history with the ATA and the SETI Institute now, going back um, many years. Uh, I used to be a resident in Berkeley, California, but I'm currently joining this call from the very lovely English village of Ashley, about one hour north of London. Um, my work at the ATA largely focuses on, um, you know, bringing all of the, the signals from the antennas into the digital domain um, and streaming those to compute clusters, largely so that YL can, uh, can, can work his manage, magic with them. I think like many of us here, we largely exist to, to serve YL. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Jack. And so if you're an hour north of London in this lovely village of Ashley, you must know Harpenden then. You can't be too far from there, are you? I'm not too far. Not too far. Okay. I had the pleasure of living there for a couple of years back in my, my photonics days. It is a beautiful part of the country. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, Roy. Yes, uh, Roy David down in uh, San Diego. Um, Longtime co-worker, friend, um, co-ham. <laughs> Uh, benefactor of Franklin on many opportunities where he's gotten me involved in, in crazy things from all different angles. And so I try to help out best I can. And it's always been wonderful opportunities to uh, learn new things and meet new people. So um, I look forward to uh, this moving, moving ahead in the future and benefiting from what Franklin has started. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Roy. Thanks, Jack. And uh, so, Andrew, let me turn it over to you and ask you to, you know, offer some some words of, of of context in terms of Franklin's impact on the institute and SETI broadly, and in particular, of course, the the ATA and uh, Hat Creek Observatory. Um, thanks, Bill. Yeah, I'm happy to kind of um, kick things off here. Um, Franklin, as um, as I understand it, um, had a history with the institute going back to about uh, 2012. Um, as, um, as, as I've heard the story, he um, had an opportunity to sit in on a, a lecture that um, Jack Welch, um, one of the, the founding scientists involved in the Institute gave uh, about a new feed that Jack had designed for the Allen Telescope Array. Um, this was a, a feed that iterated on a, a previous design that was itself uh, very, very novel. Um, it completely enclosed uh, the feed inside of a, a doer so that the entire feed could be cooled down um, and would double the sensitivity uh, of, the, of the array as it, as it sat. Um, Franklin was um, incredibly excited about this new feed design um, and, uh, and contacted Jack and also the Institute. Um, and that led to his initial um, gift uh, to the Institute to fund um, the production of, uh, of 42 of these feeds to upgrade the sensitivity of, of the array. 
Um, I actually met Franklin in late uh, 2017 and, and became involved in the, the SETI programs at the Institute um, in 2018. Uh, and um, our uh, kind of um, uh, charge at that point from, from Franklin and discussions with, with Franklin um, was really to take all of this um, R&D effort that had gone into developing um, these feeds and, and bring the array to, to an operational capability, to bring the array back to doing SETI um, uh, full time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, and to really reinvigorate the, the scientific um, effort, effort with the array. Um, and with um, with Franklin's help, uh, that's that's precisely what we've what we've done. And um, just in uh, the early part of 2022, we uh, launched full time observations, SETI observations again um, with the with the array, also to include a number of other scientific topics as well that you'll hear more about today, uh, including studies of uh, pulsars and, and fast radio bursts and transients uh, of, of of various sorts. Um, I, I think I wanted to underline something that, that Bill said, because I think it's, it's really um, very, very important uh, to understand Franklin's um, involvement um, and, and teamwork on our, on our project that maybe is not apparent from the, from the outside. Um, if you read the press releases that the Institute um, has put out over the last decade or so um, in working with Franklin, um, most, if not all of them, have to do with Franklin's philanthropic support, his financial support. Um, of our of our project, which was um, uh, incredibly significant, incomparably uh, significant to to our efforts. But um, as as important and, and incomparably significant as the financial support was, um, his technical contributions and his leadership contributions were even even greater. Um, as as Bill said, uh, Franklin spent a lot of time in in meetings with us. Um, he was in essentially every meeting, <laughs> not just uh, not just specific meetings. Um, and, uh, and, and actually not just meetings having to do with the, the Allen Telescope Array. Franklin um, had become a, a real member of the, the SETI family and, and was attending um, meetings with international collaborators uh, around the world um, involving projects with um, a variety of different, different telescopes and, and radio SETI um, more generally. And he was, um, he, he did and, and, and was, and I think uh, hopefully will continue to, in, in, in terms of his legacy, bring a, a completely um, novel perspective to, to SETI relative to kind of the, the, the group that has gathered over the last five to 10 years in this field in that um, Franklin brought his expertise in communication engineering um, and communication design uh, from his, his time at Qualcomm uh, and a very different um, I think um, uh, not just kind of uh, field, kind of domain specific perspective, but also his experience in business um, and uh, in, in leading a company like Qualcomm and how we could um, learn from some of those things in, in, in SETI. Uh, and um, it was just a, a, a fantastic opportunity to, to work with Franklin um, over the last uh, five or six years. And I think one of the, the most important things that I look forward to Going ahead with is to is to continue to realize um, Franklin's um, dream of I, I think bringing uh, communication engineering uh, and and those principles to bear on the on the SETI program um, and and push our research forward hopefully uh, to to make the the detection that of course all of us are are here to do um, I think at, at this point I'd like to hand it over to to Roy Davis Roy introduced himself already. Um, has been working with with Franklin I think for for longer than anyone else on on the call. Um, which is, uh, I, I think, an important uh, designation. And I think also um, Roy might be able to speak a little bit to um, Franklin's, the, the genesis of Franklin's interest in, in space communication and, and previous work in this area um, prior to working with Steady. So I'll hand it over to Roy. Right, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, been a long haul with uh, Franklin. Um, I first met him in 1983 uh, when I hired on at a company called Linkabit. Mm -hmm. And the history of Linkovit starts with a contract with JPL. They had launched the uh, Voyager spacecraft and they got out to about Jupiter and the communication links were stretched to their limit. So uh, Erwin ja Jacobs and Andy Viterbi were hired to figure out how to stretch those communication links. And um, Franklin was a graduate student at the time working very closely with Erwin. Uh, so he was involved in uploading some new software to the Voyager uh, spacecraft that uh, we're still hearing them outside the solar system. Amazing, yeah, yeah. 
uh, that's improving sensitivity of a communication link. So it goes back to the late seventies with Franklin. Um, he uh, got involved in many, many projects. And um, you speak of him being involved at the meetings and pushing and driving. Well, he did that through his entire career at uh, both Linkabit and Qualcomm. Um, he would drop into um, project review meetings that uh, he had not been involved in and instantly knew more about it than anybody else. <laughs> Just amazing. Um, my first direct involvement with him was um, not in a company related thing, but we we're both hams and the company had a number of hams that got together and we ended up building hardware for spacecraft for AMSAT. So in the uh, laboratories at Linkabit, we were building spacecraft and uh, that stuff was launched and used for many years by amateurs. One of the uh, first trips I made with uh, Franklin. He uh, had an old Cadillac that was a cast off from his mother. It had uh, run through uh, fenders, literally. And he drank nothing but Diet Coke. And the back seat was filled with Diet Coke cans. I ended up sitting in the back seat. So I had to pile up all these cans on one side. So I fit into the back seat there <laughs> to uh, Tucson for a meeting of uh, the Tucson Amateur Packet Radio, which is very closely associated with the uh, satellite guys. So you know, fun times in the old days. Um, he uh, rode his Segway from uh, Delmar Heights, where we live. I'm just a few blocks away from him. And it's about five miles with some very steep hills. And he went through two Segways because he uh, used up the batteries in the first one and ride this thing into work. Now, on a Segway, you're a foot or so higher than you normally would be. Franklin's not a small person. And he wore this helmet with a big headlight on the top. And he would drive this thing right into the um, elevator. <laughs> doors would open and this monster would roll out of the uh, elevator and scare people. And then he'd roll into a conference room um, and stand there on the Segway as a meeting went forward. Just crazy stuff he did. The other end of his personality, we would have a department um, Christmas party. Now, this is named the chief scientist uh, department. It's named after him personally. His involvement in the party would be as a cardboard cutout because he was too shy to show up at the, his own party. I made a point of sitting at a table with him when he did show up for parties just so he'd have some company. <laughs> was intimidated by him because of his intellect. Um, my last important uh, involvement other than um, the uh, SETI Institute, which Franklin asked me to help out with uh, a few things, he had had the patent lawyers at Qualcomm print out all the patents at that point. And this was about uh, 15 years ago. And they took up four four inch um, ring binders. He sat down to read them and he got about one inch through them and got disgusted by the whole thing and drug me in and um, asked me to be um, a technical engineering worm and get myself into the patent department and spent uh, the next uh, 15 years <laughs> trying to make them better, make them actually include technical things that, that could be enforced as opposed to just the legal stuff. So the last thing I got involved in um, through Franklin was to help out with a bit of a noise problem. And I've spent most of my engineering career just fixing things, uh, especially noise problems. So uh, I spent some time in Antioch at the machine shop making um, <clears throat> changes to the, the feeds that would get rid of some of the electrical noise without having to redesign everything or spend a whole lot of money. And uh, apparently that part of it has worked out and Sarah's picked up the ball and Alex and have uh, made that stuff work. So I very much uh, appreciate the involvement in uh, and making some progress. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Roy. That, that's great. Um, 
you know, it's it's interesting what you said about, um, you, you know, you really gave us some insight in, into Franklin, the person. He was an amazing person, a wonderful person, definitely a formidable intellect. And exactly as you say, he's the kind of person who could come into a, a technical discussion and <laughs> let him immediately know more than anybody else in the room. I mean, just, just extraordinary. And, you know, we used to say amongst ourselves uh, after, after meetings with Franklin, um, because again, you know, he, he was so smart and, and so insightful, you know, he could also be pretty demanding, like, you know, why don't you people see this? And why don't you get this? And, and uh, it was extraordinary. And oftentimes we'd say after the meetings, like, wow, can you imagine what it must've been like to work for Franklin, you know, <laughs> five, six or seven days a week at Qualcomm, you know, just amazing. But uh, yeah, we, we sort of operated on, on different intellectual planes. Like Franklin was on some plane I, I can't even see. But uh, I always had, you know, sort of a, a secret agenda in our meetings uh, when I was there with him to see if I could get him to laugh. Because I always thought, well, if I can get Franklin to laugh, you know, that sort of makes my day. And, you know, most of the time we were successful in doing that. So it was it was something. But um, in any case, thank you for those those wonderful insights. I mean, you know, Andrew and I, having been down to his office uh, and Alex, too. Um, and and met with them there. I mean, now I'm just picturing him on the Segway with the helmet, you know, rolling out of the elevator. I'll, I'll, now I will not be able to forget that that image that you've just put in my head. Um, before we go on real quick, I do want to just acknowledge the fact that we have so many people from all over the world who are joining us today. And I hope you'll stay because uh, we're going to get into the fun part of showing you what's going on at the Hat Creek Observatory and showing you some of the technology there. Um, and, uh, and and getting to know the team up there a little bit more. So, so hang in there. Uh, we have guests with us today from Sweden and Denmark, Oregon, Ohio, London in the UK, France, uh, Milan in Italy, Denver, uh, Denmark, India, uh, Redlands, California, others from the Netherlands, Michigan, Greece, Colombia, Indonesia, uh, Oregon on the coast, Cork in Ireland, South Carolina, Finland, uh, Tempere, if I'm saying that right, Glasgow and uh, in, in Scotland, France, South Africa, Melbourne, Seattle, and more. So um, once again, we're kind of reaching around the planet and it's great to have you all with us today. Thanks so much for being here. Um, and with that, I would like to turn this over to uh, Alex Pollack, who, as he said, is the director of the Hat Creek Observatory up in Hat Creek, California, um, in the, you know, the lava plains between Mount Shasta and, uh, and the Lassen Volcanic National Park. Uh, so Alex, um, I think you're going to sort of give us a, a visual tour of some of the uh, technology and, and science and um, so on that, that Franklin's engagement with us has enabled. So let me turn it over to you and take it away. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Um, yeah, so I think kind of for that bit, I just want to give a bit of an overview of how the system works and what we worked on the last three years kind of with Franklin together to get to the point where we have a fully kind of operational instrument. And maybe, Sarah, if you don't mind kind of moving the feed a bit so we can actually get a bit of a closer view to that one. Um, and while Sarah is doing that, I just wanted to, I remember kind of your, what you said, Bill, in the meetings with kind of when Franklin smiles, that's kind of, you know, you're on the right path. Uh, we had a lot of meetings which were very enjoyable where kind of you discuss um, the nitty gritty details and that's what always Franklin loved kind of if you do a very logical approach to a problem and kind of get really into the detail you could really see kind of yeah that's um, the path which he really likes and understanding it and measuring. Um, awesome, thank you Sarah. So one of the things what you can see now in the picture um, next to Sarah is the so-called Antonio feed. And that is what Andrew mentioned earlier, what um, Jack Welch came up with the second generation feed. And when we came in about three years where kind of um, Roy also joined in was um, they had built prototypes of those feeds and tested them, but they weren't as reliable as they needed to be um, to run the observatory 24 seven. So um, Roy went through on the self-generated interference and spent some time there. And we basically used kind of the outcome of what Roy did with um, the team together to come up with retrofits of getting um, those feeds more reliable and installing them and have them feasible for 24 seven observations. 
So one of the things which we've done was kind of changing all of the wiring. So we pretty much took those prototype feeds with those recommendations and those new solutions, um, which we kind of worked out together with Franklin and then retrofitted all of the feeds or kind of receivers which we had up here. So Sarah was kind of working on taking them apart putting new kind of wiring harnesses together with the new specification. We took apart the entire cryogenic cooling system, the entire vacuum system, and then put everything back together. And so there were already 20 of those existing. So we repaired and kind of um, retrofitted all of them. And they're currently up and running and on Sky. And the feed which you see here next to Sarah is feed number 21. So that's the first new one which we built from scratch. Um, based on all of the kind of in knowledge which we learned about those feeds. So it's very exciting. So we are at the moment having a run where we build six more of those feeds. And one of the big thing, kind of the last point before I think we can move on to show some, some pictures is um, we also together with kind of Franken's help, we got all of the knowledge to build those feeds, to main, maintain those feeds in-house. So in the past, rather than kind of moving equipment from Head Creek, which is fairly remote to the Bay Area to work there and then move them back, we pretty much got our clean room set up up here. We got all of the um, tools which we need to work on those and all of the expertise um, in our team so that we are able to kind of repair them, um, build them and maintain them um, for a long time now. And so that's very exciting. So we, one of the things kind of to say is like we have run now over a year with those feeds and we haven't had any downtime, which is very exciting and everything is still going strong. So now I think kind of, I just try to share one of the videos so you get an idea of the outside of the array where we have the antennas and then um, where the feed actually locates. So Sarah was um, worked around yesterday with a camera. So one of the things when we film or do um, those things, we actually have to um, switch off our um, LNAs, so our amplifiers, and we need to kind of stop observing. So what you can see here now is the field, so all of those antennas are parked and Sarah already opened the hedge on the bottom for antenna 3C. And that is one which has one of those new kind of um, refurbished feeds in there. And so we should see in a second where well, it's um, mounted. Well, that's moving in what Alex said before. Uh, so the, the radio telescope is in a radio quiet zone and um, there are strict rules and regulations as well on at the facility about you know no Bluetooth, no Wi-Fi, no car radios, or even car cars on and operating. So um, uh, you know it's 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 a very sensitive instrument. Yeah, that is a good point. Yeah, so we are very kind of worried of kind of with interference as well. So this is basically where they're mounted, and I just stop the video very quickly. So you can see they're basically at the face center of the antenna and the part here is a glass enclosure, which is under vacuum and the uh, gold plated log periodic feed here, that one is cooled down to around 70 Kelvin. And that is the part which actually detects the radio waves and then sends it into our signal processing room where we then digitize um, everything and um, compute. So that's where um, we actually then detect the signals and let me just stop there. So the other thing, so the next video I can share is would be of the signal processing room, but it depends on if people want to talk about something in between or if I should continue straight with just a video of the signal processing room. Yeah, I think you can go to the signal processing room, but you know, maybe explain also how the signals get from the individual dishes into the signal processing room. Yeah, so that's a very good one. So the feed itself is basically detecting the signal and amplifying it because you can imagine that the um, uh, radio astronomy signal source is very weak compared to anything man-made generated. So we need very sensitive receivers and we need to amplify the signal a lot. 
And then we take the analog signal, so we're not digitizing it yet. It's still kind of analog. We send that over a fiber link into the signal processing room where we then shift it in frequency. And when we shifted it to the right frequency range where we can digitize it, we digitize it and um, then send it to our big compute cluster. And I can start the video there. So that's a few of our analog and digitizer rack. So those yellow fibers, which you can see here, that's where the signals of the antenna come in. And then, let me see, yeah, that's still working. Yeah, where the signals of the antennas come in and then their frequency is shifted. So similar to like in a car radio, if you wanna select a different frequency channel or a different radio station, that's what we do on that bit. And then I think we should turn around. Yeah, so the signals come out and what you can see here where the blue cables are, I quickly stop here. That is where we then digitize um, the data. So we amplify it again a bit more. We make sure that the signal is in the right condition that we can digitize it. And then those are our digitizers, which take the signals of the antennas in and convert that into the frequency domain into ones and zeros. And then they're sent over the ethernet or the network to our compute cluster. And you can see here, so we have already prepared for the full build out. We want to extend the frequency range. So all of that equipment is already there. We just need to extend a bit more of the digitizers. So what we see here in our signal processing room, that is where our fibers come in, those two racks. So each antenna has a pair of fiber. And then we have also the control system there. And the row of racks you can see here is basically um, where our compute clusters go in. So some of those racks are empty um, because we're still expanding. And you can see here, so I stop quickly. That's our first rack where we have our prototype system. Um, and then we have more compute nodes and um, you can see there quickly as well, um, our storage. So we have about 1.2 petabyte of um, storage capabilities. So after we digitize the signals, we wanna save them as well. That is a walk through our visitor area. And that is basically the room where we are currently sitting in, which is the observation room. And that is the door to my left, where we can basically then go into our um, signal processing room. So you get a bit of an idea how the layout of our visitor center and main room is. And so the racks, which you can see here, those are all of the compute racks and everything which is purple, those are 100 gigabit fibers. So in, you can imagine at home, your home network is maybe one gigabit and each of those fibers is 100 times as fast as your network at home. So there's a lot Not of- Not in the nice there. village of Ashley, Alex. We don't have gigabit even <laughs> here. It's a good point. Well, I think- Do, it, you, do know, you have we, electricity? <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> it's, a, it's a, you know, I think a wonderfully visual um, example of, uh, you know, exactly how sophisticated and, technologically intensive this endeavor is. So some of you may have seen the movie Contact and you know have that sort of romantic image of, of Jodie Foster and, and radio astronomers sort of with headphones on listening for, for signs of ET. Um, it's actually quite a bit more complex than that. Uh, and you need all this kind of, of compute um, and signal processing to, to do this kind of work. And, and I remember when Franklin um, in one of our many conversations said, and I, I thought this was quite insightful, he said, you know, SETI uh, as an endeavor isn't really an astronomy problem. It's a communications problem. And of course, being a communications technologist, um, he was certainly in the right place and, and brought the right kinds of insights to us. So um, thank you very much for sharing those. Do you have I have uh, other things there on the video. Or are we yeah, ready I have one more yeah. picture one to more. show. Okay. So now you've seen how the signal processing looks at um, right now and what we've done. I just want to show you how the signal processing lo room looked when we arrived here and when <laughs> we started the project. So that is the same one where the digitizers are now, where you've seen the blue cables. And that is what we kind of started with. Um, when we kind of started the project together with Franklin. So I think that shows um, a lot on how much the observatory has changed with his support and um, how far we got in those kind of three years. You know, I recall like, um, the, the first time that Franklin um, saw these pictures and I think he took a screenshot of a presentation <laughs> that was given to him 
and he sent an email with the screenshot. And I think there was maybe four words in the email, which was very odd for Franklin, but he got his, uh, his message across as to what he thought of this particular <laughs> configuration. Yeah, yeah. This is a little bit like the, you know, my hair in the morning when I get out of bed and then, you know, subsequently when I find a comb to put through it. But <laughs> it's pretty dramatic. That's wonderful. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so hopefully, you know, everyone, this gives you an idea of the scale of the undertaking um, of doing SETI research and, and the, the scope and scale of technology at the Allen Telescope Array and Hat Creek Observatory. Uh, it's quite an operation. And, and again, it wouldn't have been possible without Franklin. Uh, so we're, we're so grateful to what he has enabled. And uh, I think now maybe it's time for a while to talk a little bit about the science both SETI and radio astronomy that, that we're doing at the Allen Telescope Array. Uh, sure, yeah, thank you, Bill. Um, <clears throat> so Alex, Alex mentioned all the, all, the, all the pipeline basically starting, we, we, call, we call radio astronomy a pipeline. It's just an analogy to a, a pipe of water pumping, um, pumping water down, down a drain and we have to collect it at some point and do something with it. Um, so Alex showed everything from starting from the feed to the signal processing room to the digitizers that um, Jack um, have have done an incredible work trying to trying to get all of this working. Um, and then once the signal is digitized, it gets sent into um, our compute cluster. Now, um, once the data is on in our compute cluster, the, the, the data rate is, is so large, we have to we have to write really optimized um, um, signal processing um, um, compute software um, to, to make sure that we can analyze the data fast enough and we can know what to save and what to not. And um, again, Franklin was a, was a big contributor in, in terms of his intellect in, in how, we, how we deal and how we do with, um, with, 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 this, with this influx of, um, of data. Um, I guess to, not to go too much into details, I can actually show a couple of pictures that um, um, what we're currently doing right now at the ATA and um, how, how things are set up. So maybe I can share my um, overly complicated screen here for a second. Um, this, is, this is here what we call an observing um, uh, a VNC. It's a, it's a virtual, um, virtual shared desktop that um, I myself um, here from the observing room or someone from on the other side of the planet can access at the same time. And it's just a way that we observers can um, essentially um, co collaborate and make sure that we don't overstep on each other's feet pretty much. Um, now, I'm not gonna go into too much details. There are a few things that I might show here very quickly. Oh, whoops. Um, this just lists the, um, the antennas that are currently being in use. And as Alex mentioned, we have 20 antennas right now. Um, with the current capability, hopefully we can get up to um, 24 or 28 in the very near future. Um, but this is showing that um, 20 of our antennas are currently doing an observation of um, this object called a pulsar um, that has a really particular name, J0332 plus 5434, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, this is just a, a source that we currently observe every now and then. Um, and these are the software tools that we use. Um, so basically here we're recording in, in this current um, observing epoch for um, 1200 seconds. So this is currently um, going right now. I will um, very quickly show what, what the what that signal of a pulsar would look like. Um, it's, it's just this squiggly lines um, um, all in and about, but um, when, when we see something like this, we get really excited because um, our telescope basically, we know that our telescope works. We know that our telescope, you know, there's a 10,000 ways our telescope can fail, but there's only one way that it can work. And when we see something like that, we know that our instrument is actually functioning 100%. Um, so this is this is the output of what we call a beam former. So in a way, when we when we when we get all the data from all the antennas, we have to um, in a in a manual way make sure that we align them all in such a way that we can combine all the antennas or we coherently combine all the antennas together to produce an output data product. And again, Franklin was a, was a major sort of contributor um, into how into how the system works. And um, finally, when we when we see a signal like that, so this is this is the um, um, the, the the characteristic of a of a pulsar signal. Um, we're definitely excited when when we see that. Um, I'd like to also show what it means to do um, to do SETI by showing an artificial signal, but on on uh, well, basically a human made artificial signal on another planet. Um, what we're seeing here is a is a um, 
as a signature of the Mars um, 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 the Mars Express orbiter that is um, I think it's the um, European Space Agency um, orbiter around around Mars that that does um, ex Mars exploration, and um, we can see its its downlink frequency um, by simply you know turning on our beamformer, pointing at at Mars, and trying to pick it up. Um, so what we see here is um, time as a function of frequency. So frequency on the x-axis, time on the on the on the y-axis. And again, whenever we see a straight line, we're definitely excited. And and the reason why is we know that the signature of this of this signal is in such a way that it drifts in time and in frequency. It's like an ambulance basically going away from us, so the or coming towards us. The, the, the differential um, velocity of an ambulance. Um, um, we could hear a, 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 a difference in pitch or a difference in frequency. It's the same thing that happens here. The orbiter is either has a um, has a velocity towards the uh, us, uh, the observer, or away or, or away from us. So this is this is a drift in frequency or a Doppler drift in frequency. Um, so this is one thing I'd like to show. Um, one other final thing here, and then hand, hand over to, to Jack. And I think um, not many people on this call actually know about this. Um, so here I'm pointing at you, Andrew. Um, this is this is a, a single pulse from a from a pulsar um, at the um, using our beamformer. And this is the first time we actually can detect something like that um, with with our beamformer. So um, yet again, frequency versus time. Um, every time we see a single straight line, we get excited um, simply because this is the signature of what we're trying to really search for. Um, and this is the first time we do it with our beamformer. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's the three minute or five minute um, summary of what science we're trying to achieve here on the on the ATA. Wonderful, thank you so much, Well, So I don't know, Andrew, if you wanted to comment further on that, but that's great to have those uh, those new results with the beamformer. Uh, yeah, no, it, it's a it's a fantastic um, you know testament to what Franklin has enabled over over the last ten years, and but especially I think over the last um, the last three or four years um, to see this um, you know just um, you know garden of, of of scientific results blooming across the observatory, um, and and we haven't you know even got into to some of the exciting things that are happening at the observatory beyond the the ATA, which is also. Uh, are also enabled by um, by this fantastic team. It's just um, it's it, it's really wonderful, wonderful to see. Yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned you know other things at the observatory, um, and uh, we've talked about fast radio bursts. We have actually one or probably more people joining us today from Canada, uh, also from Florida, Oklahoma, uh, Germany, um, elsewhere in the UK, et cetera. But one of the exciting things coming to the observatory is the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, or CHIME, which is turned out to be the perhaps most prolific radio telescope uh, for discovering fast radio bursts on the planet. And it looks like a, a series of half pipes, probably takes up the size, one, one of their antennas, about the size of a football field, Andrew, roughly, um, a series of these half pipes. That, that, that's about right, I think, in, in terms of total, total footprint of both CHIME and, and CORD. Right. And, um, you know, one of the interesting or intriguing things about fast radio bursts, which are incredibly intensive bursts of radio frequency energy, and I think they, if I understand correctly, they put out more energy in a few milliseconds uh, than, than our sun does in an entire year. So extremely energetic, but we don't know too much about them or, or where they are. So localizing them um, is like many things, often a case of trying to triangulate them on them. And if you want to do that, you need more than one observing point. And so the CHIME team have uh, gone about the task of finding other locations in which to build their telescopes so they can begin to triangulate and localize these phenomena. And one of the, the selected um, low site for North America is the um, Hat Creek Radio Observatory. So we've, we've started already the process of being able to construct and build that CHIME radio telescope uh, with McGill University and the CHIME folks. And that's going to add just another dimension of, of incredible science and capability to the observatory. Um, Alex mentioned as well that, you know, we have a visitor center. So indeed the observatory is open for you to come and see. Um, I don't know, Alex, are there particular days of the week where, where that happens? Um, yeah, so we are um, post COVID now, we are open Thursdays and Fridays uh, from nine to three. Yeah, so. so if you're, you know, find yourself up in that neck of the woods, you might be visiting Lassen Volcanic National Park or elsewhere in the High Sierra or, you're visiting Redding, California, or maybe you're a fly fisherman who 
wants to do some fishing at the famous uh, Hat Creek, um, come and see the, the observatory. These guys are also lonely up there. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's pretty isolated from, from every place, but absolutely beautiful. So do come and visit and learn more about uh, the work that the team is doing up there, about the technology. Um, if you're really nice to him, Alex will show you more before and after pictures because he's got quite a few. Um, and, and we always like to have, uh, have people visit. Um, so with that, I think we've, we've come to the end of, of our SETI Live session. I do want to thank all of our guests, especially Roy and Jack, and of course our own team, Alex and uh, uh, Andrew and Sarah and YL and the comms team at the Institute, um, which uh, is Rebecca and Lee and Beth for making this possible. So uh, I do want to remind everybody that this is a, a SETI Live program that's coming to you from the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. The SETI Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit research institution. And our mission is to uh, understand the nature and prevalence of life and intelligence in the universe and, and share that work with the world. So that's what we're all about. And if you'd like to get involved and learn more about our work, uh, take a look at uh, our website at SETI.org. And uh, you can sign up for our weekly newsletter, which has always some interesting science stories. And perhaps you're out there somewhere on this planet and you know, you're a cryptocurrency billionaire, or maybe you've just sold your company to Google and you're excited about what you're seeing here and you wanna get involved and you wanna help. If you do, please give us a call because we're always looking for more friends and, and more ways to enable the science that we do at the SETI Institute, both in the domain of SETI research and programs, but astrobiology, planetary science, astronomy and astrophysics more broadly. So with that, I thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we'll see us again next week for another SETI Live. And uh, once again, I, I want us all to, um, you know, just acknowledge and, and thank and remember Franklin for uh, his presence, his brilliance, and what he enabled for the SETI Institute, for SETI as a, as a scientific endeavor, uh, and for our observatory in particular. Uh, any other closing thoughts from you, Andrew, before we, we go? Um, no, I just want to thank everybody for uh, for joining the the presentation today. It's um, as I said, it's uh, it's it's bittersweet for us, but I think as you have seen um, from the the presentations today, there's a, a fantastic amount of discovery uh, ahead of us, and we're very eager, I think, to continue um, the uh, the path that that Franklin has set us on. Great, um, uh, Rebecca's reminding me we we do have a a, a, a few questions. Um, here. I, we won't have time to go into them in detail, but just to address them quickly, one of the questions was, what do you use as a cooling agent? I think this was a question in reference to the, um, the feeds, which are so-called cryo-cooled. So they use a cryogenic cooler. Um, the bell jar that you could see over the, uh, the gold um, antenna is, uh, allows us to pump that area down to a near vacuum. And that then makes it easier for a cryogenic liquid to be used as the cooling agent in a otherwise sort of somewhat conventional refrigeration technology to bring these down to um, uh, the operating temperature, cryogenic operating temperatures, which is what Andrew, 65 or 70 degrees so, Kelvin? So 70 Kelvin. 70 Kelvin. Yeah. Uh, so that's the cooling. Um, how can someone search him or herself um, uh, access to a telescope, having a rig of your own, um, into specific habitable zones. Uh, of course, it's a, a little more difficult and challenging with radio telescopes to do this kind of work um, with optical telescopes. Uh, there's all kinds of things you can observe and learn. Um, and we have a partnership with a company called Unistella that makes an amazing, relatively inexpensive, very portable um, instrument that is also capable of operating in light polluted environments, urban environments, and uh, but allows you to see deep sky objects, galaxies and nebula and other phenomena. So there, there are ways to do that. Um, we do have- um, Bill, sorry, yeah. sorry, I think on the radio side, I would just flag the GNU radio, GNU radio platform, which is ah, a yes. open source software defined radio platform um, that I would encourage anybody to, to investigate if they're interested in building their own uh, radio gadgets at home. Yeah, that's a great I, idea. I'd also add, there's a, there's, a, there's a wealth of information online about using GNU radio tools to, to make detections of really the same stuff we look at, that, that pulsar whale was showing is a, is a popular target for amateur radio astronomers. Yep, so uh, maybe Rebecca or 
Andrew, you could put in the link uh, in the chat, rather, the, the link to the GNU radio um, website or platform that would be helpful to everybody. Um, another question came in, I think this is our last question. When signals are detected, uh, oh, there's a couple more. Who uh, outside of SETI do you have to inform? Um, well, we don't have to inform anybody. Uh, we're not under any legal obligation to do so. We are not a government agency. We're an independent scientific research institute. But of course, who we would like to inform is everybody. Um, you know, the work that we do uh, belongs to the world. And uh, if we find something of interest, uh, obviously, um, I'd like to think obviously, uh, we would let everybody know. However, as uh, Carl Sagan famously said, based on similar words from the mathematician Laplace, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So everything we do is based on very rigorous science and we certainly wouldn't go out and, and declare a, a discovery without having first validated it with uh, different ob ob observers and observatories uh, from different places to make sure that what we thought we were seeing uh, was, was for real. Uh, but certainly interesting uh, things that we observe and phenomena that we discover, um, you know, we talk about and share stories about. You've, you've probably all been familiar with the Amuamua uh, object that came from interstellar space a couple of years ago and left our solar system again. Some, of, some scientists have, have speculated that it might have been um, alien intelligence or an alien spacecraft as opposed to, you know, a rock. So, you know, stories like that do get out there. Um, and, and, you know, even if we have inconclusive um, observations, if there's something we think the public would be interested in, we'll absolutely share that. So uh, again, we, we are, are, are an independent entity and, and obviously want to share exciting discoveries with all of you. Um, let's see, do you run the observatory on solar OCH, OCH? I'm not sure. Uh, so I'm not sure what that meant. Would, yes, would having so. panels somehow introduce, oh, probably they're talking about, do we, can we use solar power to um, power the observatory? Would that introduce electrical noise? Um, it's a good question. I don't think solar panels would introduce I, electrical I, noise, I, I but I don't know if some of the, uh, of the transformers that would be required or the inductors would be required would, Alex? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So the, the converter from DC to AC can be very noisy That's the or is very noisy. And then you have those panels distributed and they can act like antennas. So it, um, we were thinking about it, but it's um, definitely introducing or can introduce a lot of noise. Yeah. And especially narrowband signals, which what we are looking for. So for us, it's particularly difficult. So one of the things that, that uh, we get extraordinarily good at in the, in the world of SETI is understanding and trying to mitigate radio frequency interference. Because as, as Alex pointed out, we're trying to, and YL, we're trying to eke out a very, very weak signal from a very, very noisy background. Um, so, so that's a, a technology that we're very capable of. And, and uh, yes, every, every minor thing that we wouldn't even think about can make a difference. You know, microwave ovens, garage door openers, you know, cell phones, car radios, even engines, all kinds of things that emit uh, electromagnetic um, radio frequencies can be can be problematic. Um, in any case, I think we've come to the end of our, our scheduled talk here. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, especially for joining us from the far corners of our planet. We really appreciate it. Uh, we hope to see you at future SETI talks every week. And uh, thanks again to the team. Thank you again to Franklin Antonio for everything he enabled in SETI at the SETI Institute. Uh, and with that, Again, my name is Bill Diamond, CEO of the SETI Institute from Mountain View, California. I want to wish you all a great rest of the week, good weekend, stay healthy, and we'll see you again soon.